Welcome to the house today for our 12.45 service. What is it today? 11.45 a.m. service, guys. Um, we had a phenomenal first service, so phenomenal that uh, I preached like for two hours. But no, I'm just joking. But we were running a little behind schedule, but thank you for being in the house today. Hope you're, um, I don't think it's officially summer yet, is it? Is it? It feels like it, huh? Yeah, so happy summer to y'all, our first Sunday of the summer, and uh, we're glad that you're here at the Father's House today. Um, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Matthew Ornelas. I'm the lead pastor. My wife and I lead this lovely church right here, and we hope that you feel warm and welcomed here. If you haven't filled out one of our gray Connect cards, um, make sure you fill that out. Drop it in the Connect box or table in the lobby. And that's a great way to get some more information, figure out how to get in the loop, learn about the latest happenings here at the Father's House. Lots of exciting things um, over the summer, and we hope that you get to be part of that. Give it up for our guests today, for all those who are here for the first time, and thank you guys for bringing friends. Hey, listen, listen, it fluctuates between first service and second service. We never know. It's so weird. Who's going to have the larger group on Sunday. I think today first service was, but I dare you to bring friends next week and to beat them. Can we do that? Can we beat them second service? Come on, y'all. So um, you can go to barbecue afterwards. Get to the house of God. By the way, shout out to Julio and Pearl. I see you in the house, guys. Love y'all. Pre-pandemic, help launch before then. So we thank you for your, your, your faithfulness to the, all three weeks of our church before we shut down for... <laughs> <laughs> due to COVID. But we're back at it and God's doing great things. Amen. Well, um, we've been in a series called The Call. Can you tell two people you are called? The Call. And we've been diving into this subject matter of uh, what it means to be called. How do I discover God's calling for my life? Um, am I called? <laughs> If I've stumbled or lost my way, can I get back to what he's calling me to do? Am I too old for the call? Am I too young? What do you want for my life, Lord? And hopefully that's helped some folks along the way over the past few weeks, and we hope that today will be an encouragement to you and hopefully provide some guidance and clarity from the scriptures. Um, so I want to talk to you about being called to greater. Tell your neighbor, greater. We are called to greater. We're called to greater. Greater things, greater works. And Jesus, we're going to unpack the scripture in a, in a moment uh, before he ascended to be seated at the right hand of the Father, after his death, burial, resurrection, Jesus um, prepared his disciples. He took time to sit with them and to basically <laughs> explain to them, hey, I'm not going to be here forever. There's going to come a time where I'm going to leave you behind, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send a helper. Life's going to be good. You're going to change the world, all that great stuff. But I just got to prep you because what we have right now, it's not going to be like this for very much longer. And as he's sort of trying to prepare them for his earthly departure and his ascension to be uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, he acknowledges the assignment they've been given, that he, he, he affirms their call to significance during their lifetimes in the world, that their life beyond his, uh, his time with them was still going to have great meaning, great value, great purpose. They were called. He called them. And he needed them to know that. And so I want to look at John chapter 14, verse 12, and we'll pray after we read. It says this, um, for John chapter 14, verse 12, most assuredly, or some versions of the scriptures might say, uh, 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 truly, truly, or truthfully, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. He's preparing them. He's letting them know, hey, listen, you've got a mission. You've got an assignment. You're going to do the stuff I've taught you to do. I've modeled it for you in my ministry, my lifestyle, the way I treated people, my preaching of the gospel, the healings, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the advancement of my Father's kingdom. You're going to carry that on, but guess what? You're going to do even greater than what you've seen me do. I've called you. I'm going to my Father 
And he would explain in, in John and further down the line that, that this is actually a good thing. It's a good thing that I'm leaving you because then I'm going to say, leave you my helper. I'm going to leave you a comfort. I'm going to leave you, lead you, leave you a Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit. This is a good thing. You ever feel like God's not with you? You ever like God's called you to something and then you felt like, okay, I'll, I'll do what you told, called me to do. But then when you actually step into it and you're in the mess and you're in the heat of the battle, you feel like his presence has departed from you. Like you got me to this point. I'm all in at this point. I've left things behind. I've, I've, I've burned bridges in, to, to some extent. I, I, I have people who, who, are, who have walked away from me because of my affection for you and uh, my, 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 the transformation of my life. I'm an entirely different creature at this point. And now you're not here in the middle of it? You got us to believe we could change the world with you, only now you're telling us It's not really with you in the way that we've been with you for these past three years. And you want us to believe that we can do greater things than you've done? Greater? Wait, wait. wait. Hold up. We're going to do what you've done. Okay. But we're going to do what you've done without you. And not only that, but we're going to outdo you. Yeah, right, Jesus. What are you talking about? If you recall, there was a moment where Peter even rebuked Jesus whenever he had this this inkling that Jesus would die or depart or leave them behind because they had such an attachment to him. Their whole identities became wrapped around this assignment, this mission, this call to him, not just to do things for him, but to do things with him. What do you do in those moments of life and trying to fulfill your purpose in which yet in those moments you feel like God is not with you? What do you do? Do you still go after the thing? Do you still preach the message? Do you still lead the songs? Do you still run the department of ministry? Do you still host a small group? Do you still do it? When you're questioning whether God is for you, even though you know what the word says? Because that's what they're dealing with right now. That's what they're feeling. Pray with me. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, let your presence be rich and beautiful and glorious in our hearts and in our midst. And let the call of God be clear. And, let, and may your spirit tug at our hearts and lead us in the direction of your highest purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. Now, God has called us to great things. And as a church family, I, I want to just highlight some of the things since uh, the beginning of the year and even before the, the, the new year that we, I don't think we got to give much attention to because there was so much going on, so much activity and outreach and evangelism and kids' choirs and big services and launching things. And uh, we, TV Agent we like launching things. Like if there's nothing launch, left to launch, we're going to launch dinner. We're, what are you doing? We're going to launch dinner tonight, guys. We're having a launch. We're launching. Grand open. Opening of dinner, like everything's a party. Like Eddie, you saw him. He himself is a walking party, right? That's kind of that's who we are. We just like I'm not even a party animal, but when I'm here with these people, I am a party animal. And so uh, we we were at a celebrating graduate uh, uh, Mima's uh, graduation party and her th- that amazing thing step in her journey. And we're I, I'm like my wife's like you should dance more. I'm like, I, well, no, I shouldn't. Why would I dance? I mean, do we don't, I'm an introvert. Don't forget that. Don't let what's happening up here ever, ever, ever confuse you about what I truly am. I am a liar. I am an absolute liar. This is all learned. This is all technique and observation and being uh, studying and, and countless YouTube videos and sendi- sitting under other communicators. But when I go home, there is absolute beautiful, precious silence in my corner of the house. And books and books and books and books. They do the most talking to me are my books. I love my dead heroes and mentors. <laughs> Don't you love books? Any readers in the house? Like they only tell you stuff when you want them to? <laughs> Unlike people, huh? I love people though. But God's done some pretty amazing things. And I, I want to take a moment to honor some of the th- things and the people and the church, you as a church, for contributing and doing your part in making some of these happen. You guys can move through this quickly because I got so excited. I think I preached through, actually preached 
what was not the sermon and turned it into a sermon. Anyway, we launched School of Ministry last year. Somebody give God a hand of praise. We had, we had some amazing students who took Art of Preaching and, and the, uh, How to Study the Bible. And I'm telling you, we have some incredible people who are anointed and called and people of great character and great communicators coming in the house. And I believe it speaks to our future. Um, our heart here at the Father's House in Thomas is to create a legacy. And I hope that when it's my time to go to heaven and be with Jesus and to be kind of like Jesus in my own way, that I get to look behind me and say, hey, you're going to do so many more greater things than I could ever dream of and I could ever do on my own. One way that we're helping people do that is the School of Ministry, which we're relaunching in the fall again. So if you haven't had the opportunity, you're going to want to check that out. But you're going to hear some of these voices over the summer. Are you guys, are you guys ready to hear some fresh voices bringing the word of God? Come on, I'm telling you, it's going to be incredible. Next slide, go ahead, keep it going, keep it coming. We love our city. We tore it up into last year. I'm telling you, it's usually about a week long of outreaches. We try to do as many outreaches, reach as many parts of our community as possible. These are some photos from one of the most powerful events we had I think, something like 100 people out there, and everybody got saved. I mean, it's like, oh, everybody. I'm serious. Like, who wants to get saved? Me! And all the kids come up, and we were giving out hot dogs, feeding the homeless. They were giving out Christmas gifts to the kids. We had two barbers, Alec and David, cutting it up, giving out free cuts. I think they're the most popular part of that outreach. We were, I mean, it was amazing. We had a phenomenal time. Our team did an incredible job. After that, we, are, we were so excited that we joined the women's small group for uh, their project, and we went out and handed out backpacks and care kits to people in homeless encampments and just showed the love of Jesus in really practical ways. Can you give it up for the team? Give it up for those who love our city so well. That's, that, that's just some of the stuff. We've done coffee and prayer, and we will go in front of grocery stores, and we will pray for people, give them a free cup of Pete's coffee or Starbucks. And then we will pray for them and ask them, hey, can we, can we pray for you? Is there anything? We've had people break down in tears, I'm telling you, from the security guard to a young lady in human trafficking and uh, um, someone who, uh, a mom who just lost her son to suit, all sorts of things. Horrific tragedies, and we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus in pretty broken places. Amen. So we're moving along. Love our city. This year, this is this year, we started house fires, which are our first one because we plan to multiply that. But we start our first Thursday night evening. It's a weekly worship and prayer for approximately an hour. And we're through that, we're building up future worship leaders and musicians and, and, and even communicators. We had Alec. Where's Alec? He preached. He preached on Thursday night. Did he bring the word or what? He brought the heat. It's my son. <laughs> and he brought the heat, man. You have no idea how good it feels to when you watch someone on your in your in, on your team, and that people aren't going up to you after. I love it. I love talking with people about what God's spoken to them. But people went up to him, and they said, just telling him, "Can you pray for me?" I'm like, "That's just so good." Let me go be introvert again. <laughs> but it was amazing. He killed it, I'm telling you. Um, but how far is the presence of God, I'm telling you. Sometimes I don't even want to go. Can I be real? Sometimes I'm just like, long day, bad attitude. I'm funky, tired, but I got to go. My wife's like, you're the pastor. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we show up, and God moves. It's amazing stuff. It's one of my favorite things we do as a church. Um, youth ministry has done some phenomenal things. Let me, let me tell you right. They got a phenomenal youth small group. If you are a parent that ha has teenagers, you want to plug them and connect with Brie and Eddie. They are phenomenal people. Listen, they actually love these kids. I mean, they love them. I don't know how many graduations and birthday parties and all the other stuff they have done. Just as, What was the other? Sport, oh yeah, she's like, don't forget the sport games. Yeah. The sports, we've been, we've done, I mean, they, they genuinely love our, our students and we're thankful for you guys. But here you have them taking our youth, whoa, that's not the homeless people, but the other one was the homeless, where they're taking to homeless encampments and they're feeding them and praying for people under bridges and f families with kids who are homeless. Isn't that powerful? Our young people are making a difference. Thankful for our youth team right there. And then the next one is a slide of the youth. Last year, you get a chance, parents, listen, bring your kids this year. Year. We are going to rally conference in Vacaville at home base at, at the mothership, and we are going to experience God. Imagine 2,000 students under one roof worshiping God. That was last year. I mean, we had kids, mocos dripping down. Ah, ah, Jesus. All, that, all the good stuff, right? They're just getting it, and God moved. Some of our kids got saved. 
You know what's even better? They're still saved. <laughs> it wasn't just a conference high. You get what I'm talking about? It was like God deeply, profoundly impacted their lives. And there's Eddie just being, being Eddie, just loving and just Anyway, go ahead. Move on. Is that, is that good stuff? Come this year, man. Don't, don't miss out. Like me, w- me and my wife, we're going to be there. Even if we're not sitting with the youth, we're going we're gonna to sit in there. We're going to be in the presence of God. There's nothing like it gives you hope for the future. Amen. Next, stop, next slide. We're moving along. We're, 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 we're moving along. Remember, that's not the last one. Ha-ha. We missed it the last time. Multiply. So here's what we're doing. We are doing a thing called Multiply Offering. We mentioned it the past couple of weeks, and that's going to officially be uh, given together as a congregation. We're going to rally up. We're going to get our families. We're going to sell our trucks and our houses and our shoes and our Jordans. I'm just kidding. Well, you might. I mean, that would be cool. Whatever we're going to do. But we're going to give together as a church family, and we're going to give towards a few lanes, and they're going to put those lanes up on the screen. One is we're going to give towards outreach and evangelism. We mentioned we love our city. We would love to do several more projects before end of summer during the during the the sunny weather, but then we also have several that we have lined up for the winter, which is another key time to do outreach and evangelism, and so that's going to help in that lane. Our, we're doing a fall opener September. Remember I said we like having parties and birthdays? Like every year is our first year. <laughs> It's not our first year. It's first year for the new people. We really do it for new people. It's like we are new to every person who's never been here, and there's going to be droves of people moving to Sacramento and the Thomas area this year and probably for several years coming in, and we are going to be new for them. We're going to be the church that says, hey, come and meet a bunch of new people. And they're going to meet a bunch of new people because they're going to look and half the church is going to be new. And it's going to be heavy evangelistic push and thrust. We're going to have thousands, tens of thousands invite cards, door hangers. We're going to kill Facebook. We're going to blow them out of the water. And we're just going to reach everybody we possibly can. Through, through outreach, digitally, online, in person, all that stuff. We're going to have prayer. We're going to have probably another seven to ten days of fasting, naming people that we're going to pray and that we're going to be inviting. Is that powerful? Are you looking forward to that? Next generation, we want to help sponsor some youth. Not We have some great families, and some of you could really kick down last year. And you like People went to the coffee bar last year and like, here, here's take ten kids or whatever. And like we, 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 we thank you for your generosity. This year we want to help collectively some kids get there. Maybe they don't have the whole thing or they needed a full sponsor sponsorship, scholarship, we're going to help them with that, get to youth conference this year. I'm telling you, it will be so impactful for their life and for their future. And then we want to relaunch kids ministry in the fall. Listen, it's been so heavy on our hearts that God has called this kids ministry not to just be a daycare. We don't have babysitters. We have children's ministers. We have children's leaders and pastors. They love your kids. They're not just there, hey, put that in my, you know, finish, cut out that picture. They are praying for your kids. Your kids are worshiping. I don't have that picture. Melly put on this. She's one of our kids' ministers, and she put on this big old costume. It looked like a hazmat costume, or she looked like a big old Teletubby. And she, and she was doing a whole teaching and lesson in this. I'm like, what is that? When they show me the picture, and they're breaking down, I'm like, Oh, they do that stuff, like next level stuff. They go all out. Incredible. We want. When I saw that, I said, let's lean into that. If they're willing to pour out their hearts to serve with such excellence, let's support that. Let's multiply that. Let's take it to the next level. Let's become the greatest children's ministry within a mile radius. And when we get that, within a two-mile, five-mile radius, so that everyone in Sacramento, or at least the Thomas, knows if you have kids, you better get them to the Father's house. Is that good stuff? Come on, let's do it. And then missions, church planting. Um, we've given towards church planting. When we're going to continue to give through our network, help church planters. We have Pastor Lawrence in Florida right now. He's building his team. I don't know if you follow them, but Neighborhood Church is building their team. They're having prayer nights. We were able to help last time they came out and invest in their church plan. So I'm excited to see what God does, and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, we also give towards foreign missions, uh, churches abroad. Places that we will never maybe physically go, or maybe we will, but we are investing so that the kingdom of God will advance. Amen? Those are our three lanes. Give it up for Jesus. Move on to the next slide real quick. So this is how we're going to, our goal is 15,000. I mentioned the first service crew. Listen, if that sounds like a lot to anybody, I raised $150,000 by myself to launch the church. This is pre-pandemic, right? $150,000 because I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. <laughs> and I, I, I want to make sure I, I, I run the play. And I raised $150,000 and we built a team of 200 people pre-pandemic. And of course, 
everything shut down, and we couldn't find a space for a year and a half. But I know those of you who've been, Alex has been around for the journey, you know what's possible, what God can do when people come together, amen? So I just know, I'm, a, I'm just an average guy who's driven for the kingdom. And I know there's a few more people who God has in their hands. They say, I want to make a difference for Jesus. So I think we can do that. How many believe we can do that? 15 people giving $1,000 on Father's Day. That's when we're doing the offering. That would hit our goal. Or one at, at 5,000, five at 1,000, 12 at 250, 20 at 100. Let's give together and let's make a difference. Are there any more slides? If not, we'll move along. Okay. Some of the projects we didn't get to mention, we did some of the things, great things we got to do this year so far. We did 21 days of prayer and fasting. I lost 10 pounds. That was a win. <laughs> and I gained it back. But that's beside the point. Um, we launched two services in January. We launched house fires. Listen, we, the team went a little further like, hey, why don't we try three services? And we tried three services and we packed them out and we had 300, 490 people in attendance, a high for the year. Somebody praise God for that. Up to this point, over the past year or two years actually, we've given $16,000 to missions and to church planning. That is outside of our church. We're not just for ourselves. We're advancing the kingdom. We've had 25 baptisms. Here's the, here's, now here's, here's the kicker. 10 or 11 of them were two weeks ago in one Sunday. Come on. Wow. 35 new dream teamers this year have been added to the team. They've said, I'm in. I'm part of this. This is what I love this part. 245 people have raised their hand to commit their life to Christ. Can you please, please give it up for Jesus. God is doing great things. So in two weeks, Father's Day, we're bringing our offerings. We're going to give you a card you can fill out and say, here's what I want to commit to by faith. And I'm going to bring that to the Father's Day, on Father's Day service, services, and uh, I'm going to give. We're going to reach our goal. We're going to we're pray, pray for that, please. Believe for that. And um, uh, whatever you got to do, sell your car, sell your kid. No, don't sell your kid. Don't do that. Don't do that. This is for the kids. Amen. <laughs> it's maybe your dog. I'm just kidding. All the dog loaders are. I'm never coming back again. But... Let's believe. Let's ask God, what do you want us to do? My wife and I are, are doing something very significant, and so we're going to put a dent on that ourselves. It is a sacrifice, yeah, for sure. But we believe. We've seen the investment. 245 decisions since we did it in, in January, well worth it. The, the 35 people, more when you include small groups who have made this home by serving or getting in community, probably more like 50 or 60 people have said since January, this is my home. Not to just mention people who just come on the weekend, they attend every two weeks or whatever. Um, it's worth it. Every life changed. Amen. So let's do this together. So um, you'll be able to give online. You can even give up today. Give today. If you want to drop it in the special envelope at the back of the room by the exits, you can do it online. We're doing it on Father's Day, but you can do it anytime up to then. And if you do it online, make sure you click the menu and pull, do the multiply offering tab. Amen. Tell somebody we can do this. But here's the kicker. Greater things are coming. And every time we dream something up for our families, for our future, for our children, for our church, for our community, I think it would do us well to revisit the scripture in the words of Jesus and really meditate on that, that thought. You're going to do greater things. Because here's the reality that no matter what we achieve or accomplish, no matter uh, how, many, how, many, how many decisions we might count in baptisms, those are wonderful. We're aiming for 20 small groups in the fall. We're aiming for 30 to 50 leaders in the pipeline coming up ready, ready to lead small groups, ready to lead teams. We're aiming for a group of 10 to 20 people who say, you know what, I would love to be part of a future location in another area of town. And I want to form a small group and be part of that group to be ready in the next couple of years to reach other parts of the city. As much as we dream up those things, when we achieve them and God honors those, those acts of faith, he's not done. There's more to be done. He's not done yet. He's just getting started. And that's what he's trying to explain to the disciples. Listen, you're going to do what I've done, but you're going to do more. It's not done. Just because seasons are changing. You are called to follow me as I did my physical ministry, earthly. My, my bodily presence was here with you, but I'm still going to be with you through my Holy Spirit. And you're still called. 
And what I leave you with now is going to be so much more powerful than what I am here in the physical. Because now you're going to have the Holy Spirit. you go on to explain. And he's going to give you power. And you're going to preach with boldness. And you're going to light a revival throughout the land. And you're going to reach the nations for my glory and my honor. It's better that I go on. And I wonder if today God is saying and speaking to some of us that no matter what you achieved or haven't achieved in the past, in the past decade or five years or two years or now that you're out of college, no matter what you feel you have succeeded at or not succeeded at, what if God is saying to you, I'm not done, we're just getting started. You might be entering into a new phase of the call, but this will be greater than the last phase. Don't plant your stakes too deep. Be ready and unhitch them because I'm moving you into something greater than you've ever dreamed of. I say to you, most assuredly, the word is in, in, the, in the Greek is amen, amen. He says, truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. I'm going away. When I was little, when I was little, my kids were little. Say, I you right there. It's so funny, my, my wife's phone says, uh, when Sayla's call comes up, it says the middle one. <laughs> Malcolm in the middle. No, uh, yeah, I, she, she, she was little, and when she was uh, a, a toddler, and, you know, maybe four or five up to then, when I would go to work or have to leave the house for something, she would go up to the doorway and she would put her leg up like this. And she would try to stop me from leaving the house because she didn't want me to go. And it made leaving the house so hard. <laughs> you know, um, I always wanted to have daughters. You know, when I was 12, I said to myself, I can't wait to get married and have daughters one day. Because I always imagine I'm going to treat them like princesses. I'm going to be the dad that does their hair. And I'm going to let them do, I, I shouldn't have let them paint my nails, but they did that and they never took it off. And so I had, there was one point where I had it like for a week and I'm like, it's summertime. I'm not going out in my flip-flops. I have toenail polish on my toes because the kids didn't take it off. And, you know, um, <coughs> she would try to keep me from leaving the house. <coughs> and she doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she didn't do that anymore. But when she did, it made me feel like I was on top of the world. It made me feel like the man. It made me feel like Loved. It made me feel like my presence mattered. And then when my presence was not there, it affected my home. It affected my daughter, my kids, in a way that was deep and emotional. And I wonder if it was like that for the disciples. Jesus was like, I'm leaving. I'm going to the Father. And I wonder how their hearts felt within them. Wait a minute. Uh, this is not registering. We've been with you. We've left house and home, relationships, success, our own agendas, our own plans for your call. What do you mean? What do you mean you're leaving? What do you mean you're leaving? You don't get to leave. No, we left. We left everything. Imagine Peter, Andrew, Thomas. We left it all. Jesus, we left. We sacrificed. We slept and acted like homeless men with you in gardens in the middle of the night. We, 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 we would, we, we will still follow you. Anywhere. So why would you leave? Have you ever felt the emotion that they felt? Have you ever felt that conflicted feeling of the sense of call and the sense as where's the hand of God? Where are you in this? You spoke this to me, but my emotions are not connecting with the call right now. And it feels more like you're saying you're not going to be there than that you are. How conflicted must they have felt to hear the Son of God saying you're going to do greater things. 
but I'm not going to be here. What do you do when you have this grand vision that's been spoken into your life, but you have this moment of crisis where you realize it was never really about changing the world. It was about knowing the one who made it, created it, and called you to change the world. I imagine they felt someone like David when he cried out after sin. He said, hey, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of salvation. Please don't leave me. I know I messed up. Please don't leave me. What are they wondering? Did we mess up? Was this, is this a fluke? Was this, are you a fraud? What is this? How must they have felt when he was he crucified and they watched him die before their own eyes and buried in the grave of a rich man? How must they have felt then? And they were hiding for their own safety, their own lives, to protect and preserve their human existence, wondering if it was all just a sham. But can I tell you, the call is never a sham. When God speaks over your life, the call will be tested. Your resolution will be tested. Your resilience will be tested. Your faith will be tested. Your courage will be tested. Your integrity will be tested. Your relationships will be tested. Your marriage will be tested. Everything about your existence will be tested. But faithful is the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And if he whispered your name in the dark, he for certain will continue to speak. Speak your name in the light. You are no longer lost, but sons and daughters of the king. And though his presence may not be what you think it is in the moment, you may not feel him the way you wish you could. You may not be as sure as you once were. The call is irrevocable. The gifts are irrevocable. The purpose of God is indestructible. The plans of God cannot be done away with. God has built you for this moment, for this season, for this assignment. He has built you for something greater than you can imagine. That's why Jesus doesn't give them specifics. He simply says you're going to do greater. Because there is no end of greater. Because once you get to great, there's more. And sometimes in order to live a greater life, you have to be willing to surrender your version of the good life. Maybe it's the American dream. Maybe it's monetary, momentary success. Maybe it's the vision of grandeur that you had or the fame or, 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 or being popular or getting all the degrees and being approved by your family or doing all those things. Not that there's anything entirely wrong with those things, but what if the call of God is in opposition to the call of men? What if the dreams of God are stomping all over the American dream and saying, I want more. Don't you diddle, dare settle for anything less than what I've created you for. You're a dreamer. You're, you're, you're a believer. You're cold. You're set apart. You are mine. And you're going to do greater things. You're born for greater things. What does that mean, Jesus, greater things? What do you mean greater things? What do you, what do you think they're thinking? Greater things. What the heck, greater things? You just raise dead people. Are you going to do greater than that? multitudes back in at your call. They followed you from town to town, village to village because of your way of communicating, your teaching was unlike any other. We're going to do that? How? How? How could we do anything like what you're doing at much less greater, 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 greater things? Here's what's so interesting is that he's not speaking just to his immediate audience, his immediate followers who are present in that moment of time he is speaking into the future because when he says those who believe he's implying that anyone who ever believes in him will do greater things than he did that will break your brain And I think there's so much room for mystery in the scripture that we have to always try to dissect everything, every truth, every principle, and figure it out so that it makes sense to us, rather than embracing the mystery that's part of God's will for our lives. Here's what makes sense to me, is that after Jesus died, the church grew at 3,000 people overnight. <laughs> greater things. Somebody say greater things. After Jesus resurrected and ascended to the Father, <laughs> revival broke loose in the book of Acts. 
People started preaching, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, doing great works. I mean, the ushers were doing miracles and works. Stephen was martyred for the faith by Saul. Are you with me, Mike? Greater things. The Apostle Paul converted, and he brings, the, he brings the gospel to the Roman Empire, and he brings it all over to these different places and spaces where the gospel had not yet touched and to hearts that had not been impacted by the gospel, and the church began to explode all through the planet and throughout history. An estimated 2 billion plus people. Now, I don't know where they are on a personal level as far as their faith in Christ, but two billion, over 2 billion people declare, they, they, they call themselves, they identify as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ all across the world. The church has launched, thank you, oh. Come on, give it up for Nico. That's my guy right there. I love you, man. He answered the call. (laughs) Even in a Dutch Bros Cup. So thoughtful. I didn't know what first, man. I, you know, I, I, did tens of, I, I, I did a long time of ministry in the DPH. You're always looking over your shoulder in those places. I just saw somebody, Mex- Mexican dude, walking up. on. I caught that. You know, peripheral vision, man. It's like I was trained by the hood. It's the hood I die for. Lie for. Cry for. The only reason why I come outside for is the hood I die for. Lie for. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Oh, man. Throwback. My wife's like, stop, please. <laughs> I'll answer your call. <laughs> Here, I'm going to wrap this up. The call, church. Jesus said greater works. Jesus didn't start hospitals and orphanages and shelters. He was limited to Jerusalem. But after his resurrection, the church went to the nations. And all across the globe, people are calling upon the name of the Lord. Churches in persecuted countries. Africa has the largest Christian population in the world currently and growing. In the 2030s, they say it'll be China with the underground church rapidly expanding and impacting in a communist country. The, 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 the future of that nation, I'm telling you right now, when Jesus said greater things are going to happen, he means greater things will happen. So here's my deal. If Jesus said it, shouldn't I believe it? And if I should believe it, shouldn't I do it? And if I'm doing it, Shouldn't we see something happening around us? I believe we are. I believe we are on the verge, the precipice of the greatest move of God we have ever seen in our nation. How many are crying out for that, believing for that, and expecting an awakening in our land? I believe the rumblings of revival are here right now, and God is saying, who will go? Who can we send? Who can we raise up? Who will be, who will be the voice? Who will be, who will be, who will be, who will be the one who says, yes, Lord, to the call? Whatever you want, whatever you need me to do. You don't have to be a pastor to share your faith. You don't need to be a preacher to lay hands and see the sick recover. You don't have to be a church planter to launch kingdom initiatives. You don't have to be, you don't have to be what has traditionally been recognized as a calling. You can walk out your destiny, your mission, your assignment, whatever it looks like, and walk with Jesus and see lives changed and raise up generations that were forever impacted carrying the legacy of the gospel into the future. You can answer the call no matter where you've been, where you come from or where you are right now presently because the call doesn't come from the church. The call doesn't come from men. The call doesn't come from your mama. Your, the call comes from the heart of the Father. The call comes from God who will answer the call. Jeremiah tried to run but he answered the call. He said, you're worth like fire. Shut up in my bones. Peter dropped his nets. John dropped his nets, left their family business and they answered the call. When's the last time you left something for Jesus? 
He left heaven for us. He left the wealth of the kingdom for us. He gave up his he gave up certain attributes of his divinity for us. Wrapped himself in human flesh. Was bloodied and beaten and crucified for us. Kissed death for us. And in America, all we can think about is what will you do for me today, Jesus? We think we're doing God a favor when we go to church on Sunday. We think we're doing God a favor when we give up a bad habit. We think we're doing God a favor and doing God a favor. God doesn't need me. But oh, does he want me. And oh, does he love you and me. And that love is worth leaving everything for. The call of God will ask you to surrender some stuff. I'll ask you to persevere through some tough times. Following the call of Christ in my life has cost me many things. I'm a blessed man. God's good. He's faithful. I've got a wife of 18 years, three beautiful kids. They're all going to be teenagers by the end of the year. (laughs) That's crazy. But they're all loving Jesus. They're all in the house of God. They're all serving. They're in worship. They're in kids' ministry. They're in production. They're in media. They're in outreach. They're in small groups. They're serving Jesus. They're not perfect, but they're good. They're great. They're amazing, and I love them. But I've seen my wife cry. Because of some of those sacrifices along the way. Bro, we can barely give up a donut to do a 24-hour fast. And Jesus is like, hey, pick up your cross to follow me. We're like, "Uh, uh." We've left houses. We've seen relationship put on hold for a while because people couldn't understand our devotion to Christ. We've had family members who weren't accepting of our ministry and not attended certain things because if we can't bring our spiritual family with us and that's all, we're all they have, then maybe, maybe we're not that much of family. We've had those moments. We've had people who don't want to be around us anymore because we're all about Jesus. I've had people that have led to Jesus come to a point where they said to me, I don't want to be around here anymore. All you guys talk about is Jesus. <laughs> I said, that's not true. Talk about baseball. <laughs> I talk about music. <laughs> I talk about, but it's all for Jesus. <laughs> Listen, when you follow Jesus, it'll be the most painful thing you've ever done in life. When you follow Jesus, it will be the most beautiful thing you've ever done in your life. Every tear will be worth it. Because when that final call echoes and calls you out of the grave at the end of your life and into the presence of the Father, that familiar voice that says, well done, good and faithful servant, will be worth every sorrow, persecution, trouble, or struggle. But don't get me wrong. I'm living a really good life. I wake up wanting to live. I go to bed having trouble going to bed because I want to (laughs) live. There's too many good things to have to do. What about you? Whatever state you are in today, he is calling you. Maybe you know exactly what he wants from you going after it. Don't get discouraged. Maybe you have not a clue. You're like, I'm trying to figure it out. You're in a great space. Try things. Y'all just graduated school, college, high school. Try some stuff. You're 20 years old. Try stuff. (laughs) I was 19. I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? (laughs) What am I going to do? 
everything. You do everything that's healthy and good and God-honoring, and you do everything that's in line with your gifts, everything that he's showed you so far. You just give yeses and yeses and yeses to God until you hear him say no. And along the way, you figure out exactly what you're supposed to be doing. See, the problem with a lot of young people is that we don't try enough stuff. I'm not talking about drugs. <laughs> oh, let me try that. Oh, let me hit that. Oh, yeah. We don't try enough good stuff, and we sit there in our bedrooms crying to ourselves, thinking through all this stuff about all the things we should be doing and how everybody's ahead of us. Forget just young people. We're talking about 30s, 40s. We hit these crises every every decade. It seems I'm like, I should be. 30s, I was like, man, that dude's way ahead of me in life. What I, I should be doing this. Listen, forget that. He is not your standard. She is not your standard. Get off of Instagram. Delete it for an hour or a day or a week or a month and lock yourself into the presence of God and hear the call of God again. Let him define what success is for you and your family and your future and your marriage. Stop trying to live up to the expectations of the world and actually create with God your own future, your own life. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Can I get an amen in the house right now? Come on, I'm preaching better than y'all are praising and shouting this morning. If you believe God's called you, shout amen. If you believe he's calling the next generation, shout amen. Come on, stand to your feet with me today. Father, we welcome your presence right now as we close up our service. Thank you for your goodness. We are here gathered in your name, and we need you. There are many here right now who are maybe frustrated. They're looking for direction. I pray clarity. I pray for the one who's wrestling. They're like Jonah, trying to run from what you want from them what you prepared for them. It's beautiful. It's not always easy, but it's incredible. I pray that they would have an injection of the Spirit of God's courage in their hearts, God, to do what you have anointed them to do. I pray for the one, God, who's, who, who's hungry. They want it. They just don't know what it is. Would you give them revelation today, God? Jesus, would you give them revelation of what you want? Even if it's not what's in store in 10 years or 20 or 50 years or five years or two years or one year, would you show them the next step? Because maybe that's where you want them to come to know you is in the next step of obedience and trust. Because the next step will lead to the next, then the next, then the next. And before we know it, we realize we have built a life of following Jesus. Father, right now, impart whatever you desire to our hearts. If you're here in this place and you say, Pastor Matt, I want to know Christ as Savior and Lord, the very most important call is the call to know him as Savior, the call to repentance, the call to faith in Christ as your king. And if you say, I want to know him, I believe he died on the cross and resurrected from the grave on the third day. And I want to know him as my Savior and King, forgiver of my sins. If that's you, with no one looking around, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. And I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of faith in Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Just lift your hand. God bless you. Hold it up for just a second. Hands going up over here. God bless you. God bless you. No matter your age, no matter what you've been through, God bless you. God bless you. They're going to put a card in your hand. Hold your hand over a second. Before you leave, fill out that card. Drop it in the box. We'll give you some next steps in the lobby. Drop it in the box in the lobby. Anyone else, anyone who says, I want to recommit my life to Christ. I lost my way, but I'm ready to come back home to my Father who loves me. You say, I want to recommit my life, rededicate my life to Christ. Just raise your hand, anyone else in this place. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about simple ritual. We're talking about a deep, profound knowledge of the one who lovingly created you for purpose. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask the church, the believers, to pray along with those who are, I'm leading in this prayer. Would you pray with me out loud this prayer of commitment to Christ? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross and rose from the grave on the third day. Please forgive my sins. I need a Savior, so I surrender to you. Thank you for accepting me into your family. Thank you for leading me home. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. We pray for every person who's taken this step of faith. It is not the final, but it is the first, and it's such an important step. 
God, we pray that as this journey unfolds before them, that they would come to know you and your love and your plan for them in a deeper way than ever before, that they would experience the adventure of a lifetime, God. The joy of God would begin to fill their soul right now. Contentment, peace, whatever it is that needs healing in their soul, body, mind, spirit, release it right now in them. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for them. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Would you give it up for those who have made that decision today? Come on, welcome to the family. God bless you guys. Listen, that's the first step. Fill out that card. Turn it into the connect table in the lobby after after service. And we'll give you some next steps and some resources. Listen, we're going to do something at, at the doors. You guys don't have to come down, but the ushers are going to have our, our uh, multiply cards on the way out. Would you fill that out? Ask God, what are you going to do? What do you want to commit to giving? And then in two weeks on Father's Day, we're going to bring our offering together and we're going to celebrate that act of generosity and worship unto the Lord. So they'll hand you that card on the way out and uh, and, and you can uh, go ahead and fill that and drop it in the box at the door. We love you guys. Let's sing this song one time through and then you guys can be dismissed. Come on. <laughs>